invite you to take a Bible and to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, is where we'll begin this series, and uh, Lord willing, where we'll end it uh, Friday night, but uh, it is good very much to be with you. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity and appreciate the invitation of the elders. I've known of this congregation for a number of years, uh, but it's the first time I've had a chance to visit with you, so... I'm thankful for this, uh, for this time, and I hope and pray to do you good and no harm that uh, this material will be a blessing to you. I think it is certainly a needed subject in our age, though I'm sure it's material that many in this audience are well familiar with. But uh, at the same time, I think it's important for us to continue to present God's wisdom. We hear so much foolishness that uh, we need to be reinforced in these matters. So we start off in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1 reads, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun of the light of the moon of the stars be not darkened, Though the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, the doors shall be shut in the streets, the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of a bird. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way. And the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, of the pitcher broken at the fountain, of the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. The spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. We've read this passage many times, and we recognize it to be a, a figurative description of old age and the effects of old age. We have some strange ideas about aging in our society, Um, There's nothing that is more natural and more common. It is universal, in fact, and yet it is uh, uh, looked at as an insult. Uh, I've told the story in the family many times about an aunt of mine. She's long gone now, but uh, my mother's oldest sister, she was not a member of the church, by the way, but anyway, back in the day, there's a famous family story about some poor waitress who offered her the senior citizen's discount I think uh, she wasn't going to be 65 until uh, maybe two months after that, and boy, did she get an earful uh, about assuming that, didn't make that mistake again. But, you know, it's just strange how people think about age as being an insult. And I'd like to think that we're immune to that, but I suppose if a fellow like me, some stranger came in here and said to the congregation, I didn't realize how old you people are. A lot of old folks here. It's an old church. We'd say, well, that's not nice. Who's this guy? But if the same guy came in, he said, well, there's a lot of young people. It's a young church. That'd be a compliment. Why is that? I don't know. I have to admit, even Solomon talks about it being the evil days. But that's not the whole story. And, And so I'd like this morning to start off by thinking about God's wisdom concerning age and aging, something very practical to all of us. Um, The idea that age certainly brings challenges, yes, but it also brings great privileges and it brings great responsibility. That'll be our simple outline this morning. By the way, I'll have charts the rest of the time this morning. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit. So, Uh, invite you to turn with me and we'll read some passages together thinking about old age obviously this has relevance to old guys like me but you know if for the young folks who are in this audience if you plan to get old 
this will also have a, by the way, there's no guarantee of that. This will have uh, relevance for us as well. So, so let's think a minute about what God's wisdom teaches about uh, old age. In the first place, certainly this passage reminds us of the challenges of old age. He talks about a time when the strong men shall bow themselves. Most people have thought that to be maybe the legs that don't work like they used to. And the grinders shall cease, that, you know, your, your teeth don't work like they used to. And the, the windows are darkened, your eyes don't work like they used to. And the sound of the grinding is low. Your ears don't work like they used to. Now, now again, you and I understand that there are exceptions to this. We've all known people who uh, maybe had real physical problems at a young age. And I've known people who were remarkably uh, robust at, uh, at, uh, uh, at very advanced age. But generally speaking, you know, it, as the longer we live, the more troubles we face, the more limitations we face. And it's an adjustment that we have to make. I like that expression when he talks about they'll rise up at the voice of a bird. Uh, I think that has reference to the fact that a lot of times as you get older, you have trouble sleeping. Uh, and it doesn't take much to wake you up anymore. Somebody said that um, when they were in school and they used to use the expression pulling an all-nighter, he said, that meant that we stayed up all night and didn't go to sleep. He said, now, when I pull an all-nighter, it means I go to sleep and don't wake up all night. That's, that's, a, that's a blessing. Sleep is a blessing, and it can be uh, a blessing that's more elusive as we get older. Good sleep. I like the expression he uses here in verse 2 when he talks about this being a time when the clouds return after the rain. Isn't that so? If I understand the imagery there, you know, it suggests a time. Well, in our younger days, you know, you're going to have cloudy days, but then it gets sunny. But what happens when you live in a period of, of life when the clouds just keep returning? You know, you, you have a certain age where you, uh, you think, boy, my knee hurts. I got to get something done about that. If it doesn't get better, go to the doctor and they fix it. What happens when they don't fix it anymore? What happens when you just have to start living with things? And things that cause a lot of pain and trouble. Old age is pain management. I've, I've figured that out through the years by watching those around me. I've been blessed so far with remarkably good health, more than I deserve. But I've known a lot of folks of my age and older who have struggled with that. Uh, we used to have a fellow there uh, at uh, North Bibb uh, that uh, moved to our area, and, and I used to go pick him up on Sunday morning. He was 93 years old. And um, I'd uh, pick him up and get him in the car, you know, and, and uh, get his wheelchair fixed up, and we'd head out. And I'd, I made the mistake early on. I would say something like, uh, feeling good today, Brother Hickam? He'd say, when you're 93, you never feel good. I'm doing the best I can. I learned how to rephrase that question. But I'm sure he was right about that. You know, a lot of folks, if they get to be 93, a lot of folks don't get to be 93, but those who do, many times, do face a lot more trouble than I do. I park down there and hop in the building and sit down in the pew and walk up the steps. But I've known people and you've known people and they struggle to just walk a short distance. It's just painful to them. Now, what are you gonna do in life if you face that kind of pain, well, go to the doctor. They can't fix it. They can give you a pill. You can take the pill. You can go to sleep, be sleepy all day. Or you can just tough it out. It's a hard, difficult time in life. What is the old saying? Old age ain't for sissies. That's right. It's, it, and I saw that with my mother. You know, you have to be tough in dealing with the pains and troubles and the clouds that return after the rain. And if we're not careful talking about challenges, one of the things that that will do is it will tend to make us too self-centered and too timid, really. We become fearful. 
Uh, he talks about that. They are afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the grasshopper is a burden, and everything's a burden, and everything's trouble. And so we tend to rein in, and we tend to be less uh, uh, faithful, frankly, than we used to be. We let things get in the way. We don't push through. We give in to those kinds of things. And it can be a real problem. It can be a problem with, with other people as well as with ourselves. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about older people and uh, how difficult it may be for them to come. And so just sometimes people just quit coming because it's hard. It's hard to get around. It's hard to move, so I'm just going to quit. Yeah, I know, but we're going to eat the Lord's Supper together. And I need to be with my brethren like I need to breathe. And there are people who fight through. I had a chance to, to be in a place one time, uh, and, uh, and you may have seen this kind of situation. I was in a meeting. It started on Sunday, ended on Wednesday. And there was a couple... Uh, an older couple, uh, the man would bring his wife in in a wheelchair. She had lost both the, her legs at the, at, below the knee. I think it was related to diabetes, as I recall. It's been several years ago. He had all kinds of health problems as well, was not able to drive at night. So they had to get a ride. I hate to get a ride. I don't mind giving you a ride. I hate to ask somebody, you know, would you take me here, would you take me there? I imagine a lot of people feel that way. But they did. You know why? Because it's important to be there. And, uh, and they were there every service of the meeting. And I told them after it was over, I said, you guys preached a lot better meeting than I did this week. And the guy said, oh, man. He said, we wouldn't be anywhere else. He said, the older I get, the more I realize how much I need this. He understood. But you see how easy it would be just to say, well, I don't feel like going. It's raining. I don't want to get out when it's raining. Let's go to the grocery store when it's raining, maybe. Go see the grandkids. But it's just easy to just let go of the rope and give up because it's tougher. It's harder. And so we're going to have to make a decision about what we're going to do and how deep our commitment is. And where else would we rather be when the saints are meeting on Wednesday night to study the Bible? <laughs> A lady up in Pennsylvania, and uh, she said, uh, her philosophy was this. She said, I'd rather go to church and feel bad than I would sit home and feel good. That lady understood something. She's tough. And I hope when my turn comes, if I get my turn, that I can be that tough. But there is the challenge of pushing through the difficulties and not letting those things overcome us. It can not only affect us, but it can affect our attitude toward others and toward sin. You've probably been to more craft shows than I have. If you've been to many, you've been to more than I have. Uh, but uh, I was at one of those one time, and they had uh, Grandma's Paddle. Have you ever seen that at the craft show? It's a pillow with, attached to a stick. That's Grandma's Paddle. You know? And... Uh, we understand the symbolism of that. Uh, we all have, have heard it. It's typical uh, that someone will say, I cannot believe that my parents uh, let my kids do this. They would never let me do this. You know, stay up or get another cookie or do whatever it might be. And some of that's rather harmless. We don't want to try to undercut our par our, the parents' rules. But, um, you know, grandparents do have certain privileges anyway. But I tell you where that stops being okay is when we start condoning sin and sinful behavior in maybe our grown grandchildren. And we start making excuses for things that we ought to be ashamed of and we ought to be trying to help them get out of. It can happen. It can happen to preachers. I, I, a fellow was very important to me in those years when I was First trying to learn how to preach, I'm still trying to learn. But he, uh, he told me something. I was probably in my early 20s, and he was, you know, 30-plus years my senior. He said, Wesley, you need to remember this. 
be careful of it. He said, when preachers get old, they get soft. <laughs> well, I think I've known some exceptions to that. I think he was an exception to that, as far as I could tell. But I, I understood then, and I certainly do now, what he meant. You know, older preachers have certain challenges that they face also that younger preachers have their own challenges. You know, and I, I love young preachers. But young preachers, their danger may be to sort of go off half cocked, as we say, and to, to, to uh, shoot before they aim and uh, before they know all the facts. That's a danger there, to be too confident in yourself and your judgment. But for the fellow on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the danger is being quiet when you know you ought to speak because I don't want to move again. And, uh, you know, I don't really want to rock the boat here. And so all of us face this problem as we get older that we're going to have to continue to call sin, sin, and truth, truth. And to practice that ourselves and to not excuse anything else in other people. That's, that's our challenge. Uh, as older people. I'll tell you another thing, one more challenge that I'll mention here, is that, uh, that the physical limitations can turn into timidity, which can turn ultimately into bitterness. We may have seen that before, too. Uh, I can relate to what one fellow said. He said, you know, I, I've met some folks, so older people, so mean they make you cry. <laughs> uh, I've, some of you may have heard me tell this story. I don't know somewhere else, but I've never forgotten it. Early, early in my efforts to try to preach, I was in my early 20s, and there was at the congregation there a, a brother, I don't know, 50 years my senior probably, named Lawrence. Uh, that was his first name. I didn't call him Lawrence. I called him Brother So-and-so. But anyway, Lawrence. And it was not well with Lawrence. Lawrence was uh, troubled by many things. He was a bachelor at that point. And when you went to see him, what would happen is he would uh, repeat to you on a loop almost all the bad things that have ever happened to him in his life, I guess. And stuff that happened 30 years ago and people that we didn't know and would never know been dead 20 years. And, and all the things that he was disappointed about and how nobody came to see him. Well, I was there. I thought I was... And it wasn't uncommon for me to meet somebody who was coming his way. Uh, or maybe I would uh, uh, just have uh, missed someone who had been there. But anyway, it was not well with Brother Lawrence. I'm not mocking the man. I, I know he did have problems physically and otherwise. And I know those were real to him. But the problem was that's all he talked about. Every time you saw him. He just, and I'll tell you why. Because that's all he thought about. Because when nobody was there, that's what he was doing. He was just going over that and going over it and sinking deeper and deeper. And I'm here in my 22-year-old wisdom, and I'm wondering, how can I help this guy? Because I'm worried about him. I, I, I wonder if he's going to make it. You think, think I'm ready for heaven when I, my mind is in a place like that? I didn't know what to do. But one day, an older brother went with me to see him, who was a whole lot wiser than I was. So here's what happened. We come in, we sit down, Brother Lawrence starts up as he normally did with all of his list. And the older brother that was there with me and had about all that he could stand. And so just in the middle of his speech, just interrupting him, he said, uh, I'm okay. And he said, he just shook him, you know. And he said, I, I just thought I'd tell you, you didn't ask me, I, I'm okay. My wife's been sick, but she's better. <laughs> And it, it shamed him. You know, it stunned him. He realized at that moment he hadn't even thought to ask how anybody else was doing. He was so absorbed in what was going on with him. And uh, I just thought that was really wise. I'm not saying that cured him, but I did notice that the next time we went uh, to visit him with, with this brother, he asked how we were doing first. So I thought, now there's some progress. But... You know, it is a problem. What kind of older person am I going to be? Am I going to be somebody who's just so absorbed in the negative and the bitter that I only think about me and I only can... 
I tell you, I've known some folks so sweet they make you cry. Older people. There's a great story about a fellow who was a preacher in Birmingham for years. And a well-respected man. And he came down with a fatal disease. And his end was a hard, difficult end. And somebody went to see him and ask him about his situation, you know, sympathizing with him or trying to. And the brother said, you know, all my life I've preached to people and told them to have faith. He said, now it's my time to show them. That's the way he thought about it. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He said, it's my time to show them. That's a whole different attitude, isn't it? So when, if you live long enough for the tough times to come, let me encourage you, and you encourage me to remember that's our time to show folks what faith looks like at the end of life. So, there are certainly challenges. There are also, I think, according to the scriptures, uh, privileges that come, especially to old age. One of them is that I think you have a special position of being a witness of the providence of God. I'm turning over to Psalm 37. This Psalm of David is familiar to us. Uh, these words uh, we remember, Psalm 37 and verse 25 reads, I have been young and now I'm old and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends and his descendants are blessed. David said, I've lived a while. And I'll tell you what I've seen. I've seen God take care of his people over and over and over again. It reminds us of a passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. This, you remember the context here. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, uh, it's a little bit funny. He says, now, it's just not needful for me to write to you about your promise to uh, be ready to help the needy saints, but I'm writing anyway, because it sure would be embarrassing to me not to speak to you if I got over there and you weren't ready. Um, anyway, but he's, he talks about the blessing of giving in this passage, and we remember that. And in verse uh, 6, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. So let each one of uh, each one rather give as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly nor of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and then he adds this, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. And then he quotes the Psalms, as it's written, He is dispersed abroad, He's given to the poor, His righteousness remains forever, or endures forever, the New King James said. Verse 10, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now what's he saying there? I think he's making a promise to us, isn't he? It's not the old health and wealth gospel, hey, you give God a dollar, he'll give you a thousand. And by the way, make the check out to me. But... The idea is rather this, that if you do what's right and you're generous as God would have you be, you're not going to go broke being generous. You're not going to go broke serving God and obeying God. I remember when I read this passage, I remember I heard a lesson from a brother named Lynn Hedrick. I don't know. Some of you may well know him. I know some would know him. He's gone now. I didn't know Brother Hedrick as well as some did, but I thought he was a giant. I thought he was a great man. He was a highly educated fellow. He could teach so simply uh, the gospel, and I really appreciated him in many ways. But he was talking as an older man. One of the last meetings he held, he was with us at a place and, uh, uh, where I was, and, and he, he was talking about this passage, and he gave this illustration. He said, you know, when my wife and I, Miss Mary Faye, when we married as a young couple, we decided together, we set a percentage of our income that we were going to give. We thought it was a generous percentage. 
And we stuck with that. And of course, as our income went up, our giving would increase, but we continued to... But he said, I'll tell you, in the early days, we didn't have any money. And they just looked like there'd be weeks when just physically we weren't going to be able to, to meet what we had promised to do. <laughs> but he said, inevitably, somehow, something would happen and we'd get by. And that was the point that he made. Now, what was he saying to a young fella like some of the folks in that audience that day and even to me? He was saying, you can trust God that if you do the right thing, he'll find a way to take care of you. That means you'll have everything you want, but you'll have what you need. And, and I, I knew that from this passage. It meant a lot to me to hear an older fellow say that, who had lived it. You can be that person. That person who can say to the younger generation, if you trust God, I can tell you from experience, it'll work out. And you'll be glad that you did. Of course, there's some folks who get older and they never see those lessons. Uh, some people are like, uh, the fellow said, like the hog that just gobbles up the acorns and never looks up to the tree from which they fall. There are people who live their whole life and they never think about the providence of God. But for the older people in this audience, we are witnesses of how God works in the lives of his people and gives us what we need. And that's a great privilege. You have to live a while to be able to say as David did, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I'll tell you something else about old age that's a privilege. It, it, it certainly gives us the opportunity to gain wisdom and knowledge. That passage in Hebrews chapter 5 that we've read so many times, for the time when you ought to be teachers... Sadly, in that case, you have neither one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. But there's, there's time, time that we can grow. Now, everybody has a place. I love that old song uh, that I grew up singing, and maybe you did too. There's room in the kingdom of God, my brother, for what you can do. No matter how small it might be, no matter who you are, everybody has a place. And so we're not in any way disparaging those who might be younger in the faith. But here you take two people, and one of them has been a Christian for 40 years, and one of them has been a Christian for 40 minutes. Which one do you suppose is more valuable in their service? Well, surely, hopefully, somebody who's been in the kingdom all that time. How many sermons have you heard preached? I mean, good, thoughtful lessons taught. How many sermons have some of you all prepared to teach? How many Bible classes have you been through? How many Bible classes have you prepared? How many times have you read through the Scriptures? You think about somebody who's been in the kingdom for years, and they're going to be ready because they have spent the time in study and thought. Again, on the other hand, you can have people who have spent years in the kingdom, but they have not used their time wisely. And so at a time when they might be looked to and called on to answer hard questions and to serve, they're not ready to serve. It depends on what we do with it. But it's a, it's a blessing to have been given so much time that we can grow as a Christian. Now, we can just start where we are. I'm not here to, to discourage you. But I would say this to the folks here who are younger. Uh, don't waste your time. Use your time. Uh, it will slip by quicker than you think. I had a, a, a young man that, uh, came, and I love him, okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat him up, but it was so amazing to me. We had a couple of fellows over to my house. We were going to study the prophets, you know, one of the prophets. And, and so... Uh, this young man came in with another guy. He didn't bring, uh, a, you know, a notebook. He didn't bring a pen. I realize that's maybe old technology. A lot of people do. He didn't bring an electronic device even. Uh, and, I, and I asked him, I said, you don't plan to take a note? And he said, uh, well, I got one of those, um, one of those, um, uh, one of those, um, uh, what you may call it, memories. I couldn't make that up. That's what he said. 
I said, you mean a, a photographic memory? He said, yeah. I said, yeah, get, get a pen over there and a piece of paper. <laughs> I said, trust me on this one. Now again, I'm not, I'm not down on the kid, but that's just the, the arrogance and the, and the confidence of youth sometimes. But the point is that don't, as a young person, spend 15 or 20 years of your life relying on a what you may call it memory and waste your time. Because one of these days, folks are going to be looking to you for help and for answers. And we don't want to meet them with an empty bucket. Now, I say that, I, I realize, I look back in my life, and I, I realize I wished I had spent more time. <laughs> uh, there, there's certainly, I can't tell you, I've used every moment of my life to the fullest. I have not. We start where we are. But that is one of the great privileges of age, I think, is we have had so many opportunities to grow. Put them to use, I think, is the lesson. Something else that's a great privilege of old age, it is a time uh, of respect and uh, enjoying the respect of old age. Leviticus chapter 19, that's a Bible principle. Leviticus 19 and verse 32, under the law, you remember that Moses said, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. And so it was the will of God that under the law that the, the, the gray head be honored. In the New Testament, I think we can find that principle. First Timothy chapter 5, you remember, and verses 1 and 2, begins with, this admonition, 1 Timothy 5, 1 begins uh, in one of the modern speech translations, Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him as if he were your father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers. You don't just talk to an older man any way. You talk to him like you talk to your father, even if he's wrong. You respect age. That's a Bible principle. I think generally we do a pretty lousy job of that in our society. I hope in the church we do better. But it is something that an older person has the right to expect. I've told the story through the years that a brother named Carl Dieselkamp shared with me. I don't know Brother Dieselkamp, haven't seen him in many years. But he held a meeting, he stayed with us years ago in my first work and spent a week with us and it was a great week with him. And if you know his family, he and his family spent years over in uh, West Africa and uh, Nigeria and places like that. So uh, he told the story, and I hope it's been a long time since I heard him tell it, so I think I'm getting the basics of it right. Uh, he was out in a rural area, and uh, he was sort of in the round, and there were just people sitting all around, and he was teaching the Bible, and afterward, it was a question period. So uh, during the question period, there was a young man sitting right over here, and so he raised his hand and asked a question, and Brother Dieselkamp answered it. And then he had another question, and Brother Dieselkamp answered. He had another question, and Brother Dieselkamp said, Okay, look, I'm going to answer your question. Then I'm going to give a chance for these other fellows to ask a question. And he answered it, and then he raised his hand again. And he was standing there sort of figuring out what to do about that. And about that time, out of the corner of his eye, there's an older fellow sitting right here. And he got up and he went over where that young man was, stand over him and just, just slapped him right there in the face. That's not the nonsense out of it. And uh, he bristled, but he just sat there. And uh, he said, you've shamed us. He went back and sat down. Well, after it was over, Brother Diesel Kim said he'd talking with somebody there and he said, man, he said, I thought that, uh, that young man was gonna hit him. He said, oh no. He would never have thought about hitting an older man. They'd have killed him if he'd hit an older man. <laughs> I'm not advocating violence, you understand. But I, I, I just thought about that. I said, here are these folks out in the, this, uh, this you know, country that uh, maybe doesn't have the technological advances out of the, in the country that we think of as common today and blah, blah, blah. Those folks are not inferior. They understood respect for age a lot better than I've seen in a lot of places in my own country. 
And we ought to teach that to our children. You don't talk to older people just any way. And you do give deference to them. And you're not sitting when they're standing. And all kinds of things that may seem rather old-fashioned, but they are Bible principles that I believe we need to pass on. And older people have a right, I think, to expect that. It also is a time of joy. we say 22? Okay. Well, I'll mention this quickly. A time of joy in reference to children and family. I've got a friend of mine down in, uh, well, I met him in West Virginia, and uh, Mark would know it. But uh, Brother Teal, he, uh, he, he and his wife, of course, they had four children, and then those children married Christians. They were Christians, and then they had children that are Christians. And I guess it's a tribe now of about 40, and everybody in that family that's old enough has obeyed the gospel. And when they get together, you talk about a joy, a, 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 a great uh, a satisfaction that you can't buy with a million dollars that comes on his face. What was it that Proverbs 17, 6 says? Children's children are the crown of the aged and parents are the pride of their children. Children's children are the crown. That's right. And I think that's something else that you just, it comes with time. Um, you know, my oldest grandson, five years old, I'm not sure I'm going to live long enough. I might. But I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see my grandchildren baptized. You have to live a while, and that's a privilege of old age. But I want to mention this, the responsibility of old age, and I'll just say this in passing. It's interesting when you look in the Scriptures and you see that God is not at all done with people just because they get older. That, that, that Psalm, Psalm 71 comes to mind. Verse 17, O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. And now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. Retirement is, is really out of style now. Nobody retires. Everybody works till they die nearly. But when you hear people talk about retirement in the world, they talk about, man, I... One fellow said, I'm going to buy me a rocking chair, and I'm going to sit in it, and, and if I work up enough ambition, I'm just going to rock. You know, that's what I'm going to do. I want to, that fellow was tired, wasn't he? And I don't mind, I'm not begrudging a vacation, but so many people, as they talk about retirement years or what they want to do one day when they get more time, it all has to do with self and self and self. But I think people who think properly think, I'm at this stage in my life now, and maybe I have more freedom than I've had for years, and I certainly have more experience. What can I do for God? How can I be of more service to the Lord in the local church? When you read in Titus chapter 1, he doesn't just talk there about the young men and young women. He talks about the older men and the older women. When you're looking for elders, he doesn't say he's looking for youngers. He's looking for those who are older. There's work to do for those of us who are not teenagers and we've gotten through raising our families. There's work to do. Don't shy away from that. Uh, that's, I think, the lesson that God would have for us. So what about old age? Is it a blessing or is it a curse? <laughs> is it a time of weakening or a time of strengthening? Is it, a, is it a time of discouragement or a time of reward? You know what it is. It's what you make of it. And if we use that time starting off early and build and follow God's instruction, then I think we can be a blessing to many and to ourselves. Proverbs 16, 31, finally, we close with this. The gray head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. And that's right. Thank you so much for your kind attention.